Hi, I'm Joni Cooper, Director of Programming for the Docklands Documentary Film Festival. Welcome to my home office as we celebrate documentary film in this intimate virtual space again this year. Hard to believe, I know, but we're in another year. I found it surprisingly delightful and hope you're experiencing the same. The only difference being that this year there's a possibility of few in theater screenings. Thank you for joining me while I chat with the director of Big Versus Small, Mina Dufton, who's in Finland right now, and her experience making this beautiful film. Mina is a seasoned television and documentary professional with 20 years of experience in both the UK and Finland. She's based in Helsinki right now where she owns Regari Films, a TV and film production company that aims to empower women. Uh, Joanna Andrade had planned to be with us this morning, but we've just heard some incredibly sad news. Her business partner died suddenly while surfing on the weekend. I don't know if you have more information than that, Mina, but welcome. Thank you. And yes, very sad news to start with. And uh, that's all information I, I have. And, uh, and uh, Joanna needs a little bit of time to to recover, I guess it's uh, touched the whole community there in Erisera and uh, on her local beach. Yeah, yeah, I can only, yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about the film because it is a glorious film, Minna. And I, I felt that it really took me sort of up and down like the giant waves of Nazare that we see. When you first started planning the film, did you think that would be the case? Well, you put it really well, and you really described the process. Um, I compare independent filmmaking with big wave surfing. I think it, you know we have a lot in common, and um, I I knew that as an independent filmmaker, it wasn't going to be the easiest of journeys to get this film made. Um, first of all, given the geographical distance of me and my crew being based in Finland and Joana Andrade and the big waves being based in Portugal on the opposite ends of Europe. So we had a lot of challenges and of course the big waves and the, uh, the weather in Finland, um, they, they really did challenge us in many ways. Um, but I don't know, I kind of, I was ready for a challenge and I guess I was prepared for it uh, in many ways at the start that I, I didn't, nothing sort of surprised me. The biggest surprise for me was getting uh, rejected for funding so many times that I couldn't have prepared myself for enough um, before I, you know, set off on this journey, but otherwise it was, um, yeah, a journey of ups and downs as it is when you make a film, mostly up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to hear. Do you have, did they tell you why funding would be not available at, at the time? Were there, was there concrete reasons for that? Well, when I, um, this film was the first, is the first film that my production company, Ragare Films, has made. So um, I knew that it was going to be not an easy job to get funding for the first production. So many friends and colleagues, um, you know, had told me and had told me all this that, you know, don't expect any money, um, you know, the first time around. And, and I guess I was sort of, I didn't want to believe it at the beginning. I didn't want to believe that it could be so difficult. And um, so I went ahead anyway. Uh, the reasons why we got rejected for production funding here in Finland uh, were A, the company was new, the company behind the film was new, and we didn't have any previous productions to show even though you know myself and my crew had 
many, many years of experience and names in the industry here. And, and two, um, I guess the most surprising reason for me and my team was that uh, one of the uh, main funders in Finland rejected uh, our production fund production grant application on the grounds of the story not being strong enough and um, that I think you know we still kind of can't believe and um, you know we talked about that a lot with my crew when that happened we were actually in Portugal when we got the the news and um, nobody could believe it and um, I I actually went back, I've gone back to all the funders that have rejected uh, funding applications from, from us and um, asked them that are they absolutely sure that they don't want to support this uh, story and this film and, and, um, and I, I found out that, that the reason why uh, the Finnish funding organizations didn't see this story strong enough was that here traditionally we like to see stories where we perhaps sensationalize the difficult parts a little bit meaning in this case the funders that rejected uh, the production grant would have wanted me to go deeper into Joanna's um, trauma and and dig around that, um, whereas I didn't see the need for that. And uh, I paid a high price for making this choice of making this film with respect. And uh, and I'm I'm proud of my decision and I stand by it 100%. I think the story is strong enough and it's, uh, it's, it's a living proof that, um, stories can be treated with love and um and respect at this day and age when we have so much content that perhaps isn't made in that way i've made many tv programs and series i've done reality tv and i'm very well aware of how people's stories and backgrounds can be turned into front page news in not the best light. And I, I refuse to work in that way. And um, I've taken up this road and yes, with this first film, it's been a rocky one, uh, but um, only here in Finland, outside we have had the most wonderful um, reception and we know from the feedback that the story has touched so, so many people and is indeed strong enough. And I couldn't be more delighted to have it screen at Docklands and in California where actually the whole journey kind of began. That's very cool. And I stand by your decision, Mina, because I, I totally agree with you. And I think that it is the way it stands, it's such a beautiful film, but it's also extremely emotional. I found myself overcome with emotion more than once, and I didn't need to know why Joanna was was filled with with trauma. But what what really affected me was was how she did overcome it, how she did succeed, and when it goes into the training with jo Johanna. This, that friendship to me was such a very strong part of the story and how they connected and the pride that, uh, that Johanna felt when Johanna succeeded and the, the, the joy and the discovery of their friendship, the kindred spirits and with so much to learn from each other. So that I'm, I'm really grateful that you that you stood with that. And I think you're right that this film is incredibly strong. And I sometimes wonder, perhaps because it's a woman's story that they kind of held back on it, which I don't want to believe either. But but we we might, you know, might might say that in some ways. 
yeah, you never know what's really behind there. And, uh, and I hope that now, you know, you know, the world has seen the film and it's finding its audience, or, you know, in the US and Europe and, you know, elsewhere that this kind of thing would maybe happen a little bit less. I've been very vocal about what happened with us and the fact that um, I made the film anyway. And um, I want to encourage other women to boldly go and make the films that they they strongly believe in. And and I I only could have could do this because I have the 20 plus years behind me and I knew that professionally me and my team could achieve this film we would have no problems doing that the, the the really the part where we needed the support was the financing and and um and I'm hoping that next time you know we'll be able to avoid those sort of challenges and we will have the support and we can go out and make uh, more films like this and that's what I want to do and that's that's a good part of it is the relationship. So you'll have to keep our doc pitch in mind next time too. <laughs> Do you know if uh, Johanna and Joanna stay in touch, continue to stay in touch on each other's pursuits? Yes, they do. And for me, that's wonderful because they didn't know each other before this film and I put put them together and, and uh, I knew because I knew them both and I knew they were sort of kindred spirits um, that they would get on but of course I couldn't have known nobody could have really have seen what came and uh, that was just magic it was like sisters or you know long lost friends meeting and they're still friends and from what I've heard you know they, they say they'll be friends forever. And I think, you know, what could be better uh, to come out of a film than, than that sort of connection. It's all about human connection, filmmaking. And uh, this sort of thing really makes me happy when I see it happen. That's for sure. I totally agree. That leads me to another thing I've been wondering about. It's like, you know, when you make a documentary film, you don't know what you're going to end up with. And in this mm -hmm. case, it's obvious you didn't know that was going to come out of it. So I, it sounds like you didn't end up with the same film that you had planned initially. Now, how, how did it differ? That's a good question. When I first um, came across the topic of women surfing big waves, it was an article on, um, on the internet about women in, in California, actually, surfing in the Mavericks. And um, I was really drawn into this whole world of women surfing big waves. And obviously coming from Finland, I'd never seen such waves. So for the first part, I spent some time going on YouTube, watching what people at Mavericks did and what people did at other big wave spots in the world. And then I found myself um, on the shores of Portugal learning how to surf. This is exactly three years ago when this whole thing you know came about for me and then i was looking for um, a woman's story to tell i'm very passionate about telling stories um from the female perspective and with the female lead and i was looking for for a strong story and during a week of learning how to surf in portugal i began to ask some questions. I was staying at a place where that was owned by um, two people that knew many people from the big wave surfing community in Portugal. And I kept asking questions because I felt that I was being drawn towards this, this story very strongly. I didn't know what it was then, but you know, I kept asking questions because that's the way to get to a story and to a passion. And I found out that there was this one woman in in Portugal, Port one Portuguese woman who serves Nazare, where the biggest waves in the world are, and that she was tiny. I'm tiny. So that, 
you know, got me really interested, you know, the fact that there was this tiny woman and these huge waves. And I, I knew I had to meet her. And when I eventually met Joanna, this was a few months after my trip to Portugal. Um, and when I first heard her story, the kind of the beginning part, I thought I was going to make a film about um, a tiny woman in Portugal surfing big waves. But the, the game changed when Joana shared the story of her past with me. And I knew that there was a lot more there um, to go on and, and that I would be able to get to the bottom of my question, which was why anyone would surf big waves like that. Psychology was the thing that drew me in from the beginning and the whole onion became to peel. And, but it wasn't until Joanna shared with me this fear of drowning uh, that she has and the fact that she's almost drowned four times in her life that I began to think that there is more to this story and there is a different way to do this film than just a profile of a surfer. And that's where it changed. And because I knew Johanna Nordblad, a uh, free diver, an ice diver, uh, through a friend, I knew that there was possibly something that she could do to help. And I had done some research by talking to big wave surfers and I knew that they were really into trying the cold um, to develop techniques of surviving the wipeouts. And I knew, knew that one of the best ways to train for that wipeout situation where you are at risk of drowning, I guess, um, the, was to go free diving under the ice. And, uh, and Johanna is the, wor is the um, world record holder in, in the longest free horizontal free dive, dive under the ice. And I knew she was the right woman to, to help. And, and because I wanted the film to do more than just be a film, I wanted to make impact. I wanted to help. I wanted the story to really open up um, something new to the audience, I wanted to put these two women together. And that was the, that, that was where it began to be a different film. I didn't expect to spend so much time in Finland. Uh, I didn't expect the film to have such a long part in Finland um, that it now has. I imagined it to be a lot shorter and, you know, more, more, more elements um, from Portugal, but this is how it went. And the part in Finland, um, I have heard it's it's most people's favorite part. Well, that was that was brilliant on your part, and I'm sure jo Joanna must just be so amazed by the the thoughts that you had around that, and especially the the, the bit. And Johanna, she just made a new world record around the swimming under the ice, didn't she? The uh, yeah. completely new. Yeah, 103 meters of diving, free diving under the ice in horizontal direction in only her swimming costume. Uh, and she did have this neck weight on. And yeah, but that's it. She did that only a few weeks back. Amazing. Yeah, that's incredible. Well, I'm a cold water swimmer and I was fascinated by her statement about, well, you're your body just knows when it's not a good time to breathe. Though I'm, I'm a little bit wary of trying that under the ice, that's for sure, but I definitely will try it. Did, uh, was that a, a difficult part for Joanna to, to take on that night in Finland? I, I think she was really nervous. I mean, I know she was because, you know, obviously I interviewed her and uh, and it was a really weird situation for all of us because we knew where she was going and she knew where she was going. And, and I'd never seen anything like that being done. But obviously, Johanna is the woman. She knows what she's doing there. And, and 
and she you know she has told us and you know she she does talk about this that we all can do um what she does that we all have it in us to do that and that we know how how we supposed to be under there um i, I still find that very um i don't know i can't get my head around it i've heard it so many times but personally i i don't think i could ever put myself in that situation it's, it's too scary but but for joanna i think because she she had practiced breath holding since she was young uh in fact since those times that you know her she had had that trauma in her childhood she used to go in the pool and sit at the bottom of the pool and hold her breath for long periods of time she had been working on this on her own for many many years and actually her breath holding skills were pretty good because well first of all when i first saw her go in that cold pool that you see in the film where she goes there um she stayed there for a long time much longer than you see in the film um i i timed it on my phone because you know i was obviously wanting to see what hap what was what was going on and uh, and she she survived the cold amazingly well and i think after that experience the going under the ice bit maybe was i'm not saying easy but she was ready for it and because johanna has this very calming effect on you she she can tell you exactly what to do and to look at, look at her in the eye and 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 uh, not hypnotic but kind of she's she would be a great life coach um a coach at anything and i think it was that that made it easier for joanna but i have to say that that moment where they you know where they're kind of waiting to go under the ice you know you can see how nervous Joanna is, uh, but she's determined to go. And I think it's that determination and also curiosity to see what's there that, that um, you know, made her, made her go. And afterwards, those moments afterwards, there's something that we'll never forget. It was just a pure joy and amazement, you know, that when she came out and and she actually forgot to breathe, she said. <laughs> well, and, and I would have thought, you know, okay, you go a little bit, you know, just a little distance under the ice, then the next time a little bit further. So I can understand the, the trepidation there, especially knowing that, you know, swimming under water and holding your breath in warmer waters is a different matter than Mm -hmm. in such frigid water it's just uh, it's difficult so i was absolutely impressed and i just i was thinking about you being there and what that was like to to experience the the joy and the and the and the um accomplishment that that joanna must have felt yes it was a very special time for all of us and Given that it was the first um, time that me, Joanna, Johanna, and the whole production crew were properly together, we were just learning to work together. Um, it was three days in December 2018 that we had to do the shoot in Finland, where you see the women meet, do the initial sort of start of the training, where uh, Johanna is testing. Uh, Joanna's breath holding skills and then go to this uh, remote lake in Heinola uh, where Johanna trains regularly and, and where Joanna's training took place. Those, those days were very special for all of us and because we were in such a small place in a cottage and there was just a lake, um, we were kind of like in our own bubble. And I think that's the only way I can describe it. Very good things happened in that bubble. And, you know, things that we 
just couldn't have ever imagined. I, I could never have imagined some of the things that actually happened uh, with Joanna in that cold water. And, and you know, you will have seen that in the film that she felt great release from her trauma. And this was something that really touched me because I hadn't prepared for that to happen. I was just preparing for her to have this training and, and to learn how to, you know, stand the cold and learn coping techniques for the wipeout situation, but I did not uh, envisage something like this to happen. So when Joanna told me this in an interview, you know, I do remember that, um, you know, that time I actually went out of the cottage and had a cuddle and a cry with my, uh, my colleagues because it was just so, so strong and just so, such a surprise that that would happen. And because and we could see the, the kind of uh, elation you could we could all feel it and she very openly shared it with us and you know the dreams that she had that night after she went in the water and all that we had time to discuss and it was just you know out of this world and uh, you know if only this would be available to anyone that you know has ever suffered trauma or difficult time uh, mentally in their lives I think there's a lot that cold water can do and cold can do to help heal. And uh, it's something I'm very interested in. Exactly. And I think too, like just as you mentioned earlier, um, the calming effect that, that Johanna has and look into my eyes, just breathe. So along with that, the cottage and the way you set up the pool with the candles, I mean, I, I can't imagine a better way to to do that for the first time. So that must have really contributed to the, the calmness that that Joanna was able to feel and take her through that and then to come out in such surroundings with such support and such love. What a mm -hmm. tremendous way. And I think you're onto something there in terms of, of uh, some sort of a treatment plan for for people with, tr with trauma. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have about one hundred and eighty-eight thousand lakes here in Finland, and I think, you know, there is a lot that could be done in them. And I know that the, you know, the cold water swimming uh, and winter swimming is a big trend here right now, and I'm really happy to see that. And I have actually started trying that myself, and you know, found it very, very relaxing. The, the, the going in there is the most horrible thing but then when you come out the feeling is is just it's so uplifting and you feel like you've really achieved something and in this day and age where we you know where we've got electronic devices in our hands almost all the time that I found is the most powerful way to cut off the the mobile phone and the laptop that uh, after I go to the sea here in Helsinki at zero degrees and come out I don't want to pick up my laptop after that I've noticed that that's a really sure way to to finish the day yeah some people here they actually start the day like that my neighbor for example here she's a keen uh, winter swimmer and uh, she says that you know she goes in the sea every day before starting work and that her day starts you know, nice and relaxed and, you know, without stress. And I do believe it's, um, you know, it's something really worth trying. And I think everyone can achieve this. If you don't have ice, icy lakes, you can have a cold shower and um, there are ways around it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's what I have found. I go in the morning, every morning, year round. I'm my, actually my home is in Va on Vancouver Island in Canada. And uh, I cannot imagine going without it because you do get addicted. It does get easier to go in. Mm -hmm. And the health benefits I find are, are just unimaginable. 
And again, here too, the numbers who are now swimming have raised exponentially since the start of the pandemic. So yeah. I think it's helping a lot of people, especially right now. Yeah, I think that's great. And it's wonderful to see that people have found cold water and, and nature in general during you know, this past year. I've heard the same from the UK and Ireland. There are lots of people you know, outdoor swimming there. And yeah, it's great, great to see. Yeah. Now, the other thing that has happened, uh, I, uh, did it happen during the making of this film was when the World Surfing League finally equalized prizes for men and women. Mm -hmm. And so were you making this film well that w when that happened? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that happened while we were in production and I, I wanted to kind of bring that up in the film because I think it's such an important moment and uh, and because I know that you know Joanna you know was one of the women campaigning uh, for equal pay in big wave surfing in Nazare so it was also an important topic for her so yeah wonderful wonderful news and I'm you know I know it's not the end it's it's a constant um, you know, job that you have to keep working at it and, and making sure that we don't go to sleep on a topic, topic like that. So, but yeah, I'm very happy to have had that happen during the making of this film. You know, like what's the chance of that? Exactly, and especially having having Joanna such an advocate for it. And I also found it is interesting to hear that she didn't really consider herself an athlete. Mm -hmm. And do you think she, she sees herself more of an athlete now after all that's happened? I hope so. I think so, because she's, um, you know, she's spoken with me and, you know, we've had a lot of interviews lately where she said that she is going to you know keep on competing and she wants to surf bigger waves and uh you know i'm waiting to see what she does next and i think it will be um it will be big wave surfing um she's still you know not too too old to do that uh she's 40 now and you know i think there's still a few years that she can you know really go for it if she gets the right support and i really hope that she does um, that's another thing that we have in common that uh, in big wave surfing and independent filmmaking that uh, finding the the sponsors is is it's not that easy so we've had a lot of conversations about this and I you know I try to help all I can you know to um, to encourage Joanna to go boldly out there and ask for the money to help her Lazare because every time that um, she goes there it's um, it's five or six hundred euros every session with all the you know the fuel and the um, rescue efforts that have to that go along with um, big wave surfing it's it's not that simple and I think it's not that easy for the women because there are less of them there um, saying that I think Nazare is a great place to be as a woman because the people there seem to really pull together and I I saw a lot of equality I saw a big family when I was there um, they were all one and they were all out for you know to help each other if and I I think that was the most beautiful thing and because I didn't know what to expect that you know that and I, I do hope that she feels that she's part of the athletes there now She's a bit of a, um, how should I say, a box of surprises uh, because she, she trains slightly differently from the others. She maybe doesn't do so much of the sort of the, the gym side, but she does more mental training. Uh, that's, and that I think has been amazing to follow. She, she has incredible mental strength and, and one of the most treasured moments and poignant moments during this production for me personally was to see her make a comeback in Nazare in, uh, in October 
2019, after a leg injury, oh sorry, foot injury, she she hadn't been to Nazare for like a couple of years, and she just turned up and surfed this massive wave that you see in the film at the end, and seeing her do that and just like like I came and I I did this. <laughs> Um, it says so much about her that, and I think if I understood, if I've understood her correctly, that's one of the sort of special qualities in her that she maybe doesn't see herself or didn't see herself as an athlete, but she, she saw herself and sees herself as a woman who's passionate about big waves and surfing them. And I think there's a slight difference there in her eyes that um, she goes there when she can financially and, and when she feels right. She's not there as much as the, uh, the professional athletes are, but she's, in my eyes, she's just as strong and just as capable and with the right support. Um, you know, I'd love to see where she could take it. Yeah. No, that's fabulous, especially around uh, the Olympics now that surfing is an Olympic sport and, mm -hmm. and the opportunities there, especially around sponsorship. Um, it's interesting, too. We have another film at Docklands this year, a surfing film called Havana Libre. Okay. And um, those surfers, again, led by a woman, their whole efforts to not only legalize surfing, which it hasn't been in Cuba, but to, to try to build an Olympic team for at some point when they actually decide to name surfing a sport, which they haven't even done yet. There, it's still just a leisure activity. And that whole effort is being led by, by a woman as well. So oh, wow. the women That's are so really, cool. yeah, really taking hold and are, fine, fine athletes overall. Yeah, I well, I mean, it was the women surfing in California that inspired me to look into this whole world of surfing that, you know, I think there is something really special about women wanting to face those big monsters and, and the ocean, because the ocean is no Disney film. It's, uh, it's something to be respected and, and um, certainly in the big waves, it, it's a really scary place. Yeah. For, for women to go out there, I have such respect. I have respect for anyone surfing these waves. I still can't quite get my head around uh, how they do it. Exactly, and, and how big they really are. Like, exactly. They're enormous. And you and until you're actually there, despite the amazing, and that's the other thing I wanted to talk about the film, your sound and music design and cinematography are just stellar. Like I could feel those waves. And right. of course, they make just the most amazing backdrop for, for Joanna's passion. Mm -hmm. Um I'm all, also absolutely an audio, audiophile when it comes to film. So I appreciate when, when the filmmaker's vision puts equal importance on both the eyes and the ears. And uh, the music throughout, as well as the sound, is just fantastic. And I especially love the final song. Is that, is that what is called Joanna Alleg Allegri? Yes. Which I think is happy. Joanna? Yes, I don't know. That, you're probably right. Um, and that, that's how it translates. And yes, uh, it's a very special song for us all, the words and everything about it. Um, I'm, I'm delighted that I got to meet Joanna Allegra. And again, this was a really, uh, you know, one of these things that you, you don't know when you start making a film, who you meet and how this whole thing will end up. Um, Joanna Allegra actually came to, um, to the production through Joanna uh, Andrade because they're friends. And uh, we were on a shoot in Portugal in uh, May, 2019. And I was sort of 
umming and ahhing about what the music for the film should be. I'm a musician. Um, I play the piano and music has always been a very big part of my life and can sometimes present a tiny challenge when I try and choose what music to go for because I'm, I, I have to get it right and there are so many options and I was getting a little bit stressed about the whole thing. So then Joanna decided to, to play some of uh, Joanna Allegra's music to me and I, you know, I, I got in touch with her because I thought, well, I must meet her and, you know, maybe there's a chance of meeting before I leave. And, and we had um, on, I think it was our last day before we were due to go back to Finland, Joanna came to meet us at where we were staying in Portugal. And um, it was a wonderful meeting. And she, from the very beginning, she's a surfer too. She, and, and because she knew Joanna and knows her story, she was so deeply in um, and she understood what I was looking for and you know it was wonderful to work with from the word go and I actually just today was listening to that song and it really I don't know it does something for me and so does the song at the beginning that that's also Joanna's uh, singing with the big waves and her voice on the background um I just love that part and how it turned out that it worked so well with the female voice and these big waves and yeah I'm I'm glad you liked it and um and the rest of the soundtrack is made here in Finland and by some very very talented guys in the east of Finland and and uh, they didn't have the easiest job to, you know, make the music for the film, but they did a great job. And and um, I'm, I'm, we're all really pleased with the sound design, which was done by Yusa Oksala, who was a really talented sound designer um, who worked so hard on all the sounds. Everything you hear in the film we've made, there's nothing taken out of any bank every sound has been recorded. We even had special underwater recording devices uh, for the underwater swimming bits. It looked a bit like a fishing rod. And, uh, and in the pictures, it really looks like it was always fishing. Uh, you may be able to see those clips on our social media. But um, yeah, it's, it's a, I, I think like you say, it's equal to the picture, the sound, because the sound can, make such an emotional experience just as the picture can and um, I treat them both equal and that's how I go and I've just actually been creating a sound bank from some of the sounds that we made for this film because we obviously we had more than we you know used and I don't want to waste anything so I'm hoping that in the future I may be able to go back to some of the glorious sounds that user made and yeah one of the most emotional moments for me was when he I went to the sound studio to listen to the sound edit and uh, I could hear what he had done you know it brought tears to my eyes because I knew knew that you know those sounds don't just come from you know anywhere they're made and there's a it's an art and um, it was just beautiful and yeah very grateful to have had this team that I had working with me and everybody was so committed to making this film and and telling this story. Well fantastic crew and I have to say that I listened to that the end song over and over because it is so beautiful. Oh well this has been fantastic Mina thank you so much for for being here to chat with us and also please give when you speak to Joanna please give her our sincere condolences and and we'll certainly be following her her every move and cheering her on with her her surfing school once things yes. settle down a bit but thank yes. you for making this such a beautifully thoughtful film Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you for having it and uh, for showing it. We're so thrilled and uh, very honored to 
have, have it there in California. And it, for me, it means full circle. Well, we're delighted. And thank you all out there in cyberspace for joining us and to all our sponsors and donors. I am so very grateful to all of you for helping us keep Docklands alive and kicking through this very challenging year. Make sure you do take in all of the films and events on offer until May 16th. We owe so much to documentary filmmakers. They add so much to our worlds. And as I often say, pretty much everything I know I've learned through documentaries. Thank you. Thank you.